Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. We're really excited that you're here today to talk with B9 Creations and Patrick Dobbs about 3D printing jewelry molds like this beautiful piece that you see on the screen. Today we'll walk through some different examples and best practices from CAD all the way through the printing process, as well as unique applications for mold making and 3D printing. If you have questions, feel free to submit them at any time in the Q&A box, and we will answer them at the end. B9 Creation's differentiated approach to solving problems with 3D printing has developed a base of raving fans in a wide variety of industries, including jewelry, medical, aerospace, and beyond. And this has enabled us to help customers move from prototyping to fully scaled production, leveraging additive manufacturing. You can see here our global network in nearly 70 countries across the globe. While we're headquartered in South Dakota here in the United States, we also have offices in Denver and Dallas, Texas, as well as strategic partners and dealers across the world. Here you can see a sampling of our customers across different industries from healthcare, aerospace, consumer tech research, jewelry manufacturing, and our new custom division, where we developed tailored additive solutions specific to your needs. In the jewelry space, from our beginning, we've been a cornerstone of high resolution printing, easy casting, and affordability, up through today, where we serve thousands of jewelers worldwide through digital solutions that deliver results in a payback in months. And with that, I would like to introduce our guest, Patrick Dobbs. Patrick, could you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, your background, and your company? Sure. So I've been doing this since um, 1988. So I've been at this for quite a while. Um, we, uh, we started in business here in Austin about four years ago, I guess, and we started um, – process of developing a couple of lines of jewelry. So um, I've been a CAD designer for about 17 years now, and uh, I've been 3D printing since basically the 3D printing part of it came out. And i um, been doing this for quite a while. So I, I love the business. I love the, uh, the challenges, and I'm really enjoying uh, – starting this mold printing uh, concept, so. That's excellent. And from there, just to kick us off, could you talk through some of the biggest differences between traditional rubber molds and 3D printing molds from time, cost savings, capacity, capability, et cetera, for the audience? Sure, so the first thing for me, when I, when I first, come up with this idea um i was in the process of making a bunch of rubber molds and and you know there there's just always problems with doing that so we were we were printing things and casting things to make masters you know you end up with a lot of labor and a master that you know you may get finished with it and it's still not exactly right and so I started doing that and, and just started running into problems immediately. You know, it's like, okay, well, is it a master that you're going to cast? Is it a master that you're going to just print out the master and make an RTV? Are you going to um, actually, you know, pack a traditional rubber mold and vulcanize it and, and things like that. And because of the, you know, the benefit of 3d printing the rubber mold it just it, it cut out so many of the so many of the steps that i started thinking about it and it's like well there's there's a there's a huge gain here in time you know you can spend the extra time on the mold i can i can put i can put the separation line where i want it i can put uh the vents where i want them i can i can print several molds at the same time and have 10 of them if if i'm injecting a lot of molds uh end up saving a lot of time so um that was the the first part of it that really stuck out for me is you know i can print 
a 3D printed mold and it'll be done in about two hours. I can print 10 of them in a day, you know. With traditional mold making, you may spend a day or two, depending on depending on the process, you may spend, you know, a whole bunch of time on the master and then it not fit with the rest or, or you know, it was it was that unknown in in the traditional way of doing it that is always tough to invest time in. So could save, you know, hours and hours and hours over the overall uh process of the time. So when I when we first started doing this, um just the just the the unknown of doing it the old way is just frustrating. So I thought, well, you know, let's try this. Let's look into it. So I've found huge time savings. I've found, um, you know, time savings from not only the printing aspect of it, but also time savings on assembly and, and everything else. So um, I found that there's not a whole lot of difference in, in cost from the from the traditional rubber molds to to printing them. Um, you know, you're looking at about ten dollars for a 3D printed rubber mold, and uh, you know a traditional rubber mold, depending on the amount of time and material that you have in it. If if you're casting it in a precious metal, you're going to have metal loss. You know, if you're casting it in, you know, to make a master, and you're casting it in silver or something like that, uh, you you have a significant amount of time that goes into that. You know, so just being able to skip those steps is a is a huge uh time saving you know per mold mm -hmm. um shelf life and things like that suddenly becomes irrelevant you know you're you're able to have something that's digital that's that's you can you don't have to have stored on a shelf any longer you know you don't have to uh you don't have to spend time looking for it you know if if you have a customer you did a you know you did something for five years ago you know sometimes you'll spend days just looking for the mold you know and and, and stuff like that and the fact that you could actually store it on dropbox or uh google drive and then just search for it and print another one is is huge i mean that, that's a that's a really big um a really big jump it's you know that in itself is a huge time savings I've injected some of these molds 100, 150, 200 times and haven't seen any, any breakdown. You know, the, the molds are a little stiffer. So you end up, you know, if you bend it too much, it, it will break, you know, and, and that can be frustrating. But the fact that you can just print another one in about two hours kind of makes that uh, not that big of a deal, really. Um, so, you know that part of it ends up being ends up being a you know a huge gain to be able to 3D print a mold. Um, you know we we stack them up and uh, we're injecting you know 10 or 12 of them at a time sometimes to you know to try to get a bunch of you know a bunch of waxes out at the same time. So that part of it's pretty neat. Um, design iterations. Um, you know, you can do things with these molds that you can't do with the the traditional. Um, and, you know, we've shown pictures of the butterfly that I did. And th that was kind of a proof of concept that, you know, we can, we can make a mold of something, cast it and inject it, um, and then snap that piece into the mold and inject around it. And... I've found that it's letting me do things that, that would have been difficult to do before, you know, doing things in, in multiple materials and, and, and we'll, we'll show a, a hollow bead that I'm currently working on to be able to do things like that would have been very, very, very difficult to do before, which being able to print it, print a mold has, has made it a lot simpler. 
we were talking about this earlier that there's things that it's difficult to even get supports on um, that made it real easy to, to do with the rubber mold. So um, opportunities, you know, whenever, whenever you're doing something that has to, say if you're doing something that requires a metal mold the the fact that that mold will will be you know so expensive so difficult to to do the the equipment and everything required to inject it all of that can can be um you know a very expensive part of producing these things so the fact that you can just 3d print something and and you know you have a huge time saving already in the beginning. You can 3D print something and 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 test it, and do you know small small runs of things that you don't have to do thousands of to to make the uh, the mold worth worthwhile, you know, or cost effective. So there's you know you'll see there's just tons of opportunity for this to end up being huge for everyone that's involved. That's great. I love that idea, not just of time and cost savings, but flexibility in your production and growth of your business. I know people are probably excited to get into the, some of the specifics. So let's kick it off with CAD. Can you kind of walk through the process, key learnings, best practices, et cetera, from the CAD portion of mold making? Well, one of the, one of the important things to consider is how you're going to design it, how it's going to be, how the mold's going to be made. Um, we're showing this video here that, you know, it's kind of a sped up version of how I made this mold. And, you know, there are lots of things to overcome. You don't want to just bullion out your pieces because you run into problems with, with bullions that, um, you know, that, that, limit how successful the mold's going to be. So um, another thing I'm showing, I started making rings with plugs or molds with plugs in them. Uh, the plug actually helps to keep the mold aligned so that uh, you don't have a huge uh, separation layer. It not only makes it easier for you to uh, to get the wax out, but it, it, uh, it serves the purpose of, of aligning it as well. So, you know, they're just really fun interesting things that you can you can do that end up saving you time saving you effort saving you energy um you know this one here one of the things that i learned i'm showing here is is how the sprue i learned after several iterations that it's better to have a sprue former in the front and inject through that as opposed to uh just having a traditional separated mold um it makes it a little bit more difficult to get the uh the you know the the wax out but it seals it better so you end up you know it works better or it works equally as well with a you know traditional wax pot as opposed to uh you know vacuum assisted um you can do things like i'm showing here is where i've tapered the plug and then i uh I put the size on the plug so I actually know what size it is, you know, and and um, that makes it easy to uh, easy to look at, e you know, easy to find the pieces when you have them stacked up. I also on um, the molds that I do, I put this style number on the molds um, so that um, it's it's actually printed into the mold. I'm showing here uh, the way I do vents, so I created a uh, a little hollow sphere and uh, with that hollow sphere I piped to the wax and uh, I've learned that a, about a, a pipe of about three tenths works extremely well for a vent um, depending on how you're venting if you're venting for a, a vacuum assisted injection machine you don't want it to go to the outside um, if you're, if it's a traditional, uh, pressurized wax pot, then you can take the vent all the way to the outside. Um, but this is a, a simple mold that I did for a cathedral and 
but once you uh once you have the mold made pretty simple to inject it as many times as you need so uh this one works really well and this is one of my favorites it's fast and easy to do you can see the cad wasn't difficult um you know there are a few little obstacles to overcome but the cad's pretty well uh self-explanatory so but that's how that one was done so it was a fun one that's great you know one of the things you mentioned was all of the possibilities you can do when you start to leverage 3d printed molds and one of those is doing multiple molds for two-tone casting like the butterfly we showed and some other examples you have here <clears throat> could you talk through um some of those capabilities and share more about two-tone casting with 3d printed silicone molds sure so this was i referenced referenced this a little earlier this was one that I did that was just kind of an interesting concept for me because once I started thinking about the benefits of 3D printing molds, I started realizing that, you know, there are things that you can do like this that would have been very difficult to do before. You know, the the yellow gold part of, of this particular uh, design, for one, it would be very hard to print and cast you know, I, I started looking at just trying to get supports to that because that's how I was going to do that originally. And I started trying to figure out how I was going to get supports to it and then sprues to it and everything. And I was like, oh, it's so much easier just to lay it flat <laughs> and make a mold of it. So that's what I did here. And then when it came to finishing out the design, um, you know, I made it so that uh, I could I could just do it this way so i just took the original design bullioned it out of the middle and then uh inserted the yellow gold into the final uh injection so here's the mold and then all i did was took the injection out of the previous mold cast it and then inserted it into the mold and then injected the wax around it and sprued it up and cast it and you know i have a two-tone cast piece of jewelry that I had hardly any finishing at all. I, I All I did was throw it in the tumbler and, and sat and finish it, and, and I was finished. So something where I would have spent, you know, there's no telling. I I could have spent four or five hours trying to fit that piece of uh, yellow into that into the butterfly, um, and it, it cast right in place first time easy so so there's just all kinds of things that you can do with it that, like this that we hadn't really been able to do before so i love that example and you get such a smooth finish too when you think about not only how do i support this but now i don't have to worry about trying to have any type right. of support scarring it produces a beautiful finished piece in minutes <laughs> which is a huge goal when you're trying to run a business <laughs> exactly and it casts well because it's yes. wax you know it's really That's easy exactly. to cast so another unique application is using multiple materials. So we have been talking a lot about using our silicone, but you found ways to incorporate either a high detail resin with silicone or our ABS PC with silicone and sometimes even castable resin with silicone. Could you talk through how you're thinking about incorporating multiple materials into mold making? Well, well, first of all, what I... <laughs> You know, you run into some limitations here and there when you're talking about the resolution of, of the resilient and stuff. And I, you know, I I was kind of looking at that and certain geometries, you end up with, you know, some old lines and, and stuff. So I was looking at HD slate and I thought I could I can print an HD slate, get the resolution, get the finish that I want. And and then just put that inside of a mold, what I call a mold frame, which is just a, um, you know, just a, a basic frame that's printed out of resilient. And then that way it can be injected, um, you know, with the traditional wax pot or whatever. So that brought some interesting things because then you can get things without any grow lines, really, really high definition injections. And, um, you know, it, it just, it, 
it's unbelievable the kind of things that you can get out of it. So what I've done, I, the first few that I did, I noticed that I would have just a little bit of a separation line. So here in the slide coming up here, you'll, you'll end up seeing, um, I add an additional surface right to the end of it right there. And I bullion out those little red corners that will give us the, the actual beginning surface. So once it's printed, you see it there, once it's printed, I take and sand those off until I'm down to that layer. And then that gives me a perfect, perfectly flat mold. I use the little blue locks to lock it together and then it just snaps into the uh, resilient mold frame. You inject it and uh, I haven't really had any problems with it ever filling or anything. You can end up, if you have a problem where you might need to have a vent or whatever, you can just take a, a, a ball burr that's three tenths of a millimeter and just draw on the surface where you want your vent to be and you've, you've created a vent. Um, I've found that three tenths of a millimeter is just about the ideal number. So, I've I've done that several times and it's worked incredibly well. The other thing that we've started uh, doing is with uh, robust ABS. Uh, I got a shipment of that the other day, and we've been um, we've been printing in in that and doing some really neat things with that as well. It's a lot harder and it's a lot more. Uh, durable. So there's things that you can do with that that you can't do with HD slate. Um, but both materials, I, I think both materials will end up doing a particular job. And that's, you know, kind of the interesting part of this with it being in, a, in its infancy, like it is <laughs> every time I do something, I'm learning something new and I'm trying something new. And, and, um, you know, that part of it is, you know, keeps it fresh and exciting. Another thing that we can do with, with the multiple materials is if you're, you know, if you're trying to print a mold and the mold is, you know, the geometry or something is complicated and you're not going to be able to get a 3D printed mold off of the geometry of your piece, you can actually just take that particular piece and 3D print it in emerald green, if you will, and snap it into the mold and inject the wax up to it and around it. And then you're only burning out a small piece of resin as opposed to, you know, a huge piece of resin. So things like men's rings and, and things like that that may have a huge, really complicated, um, you know, large mass with some fine detail on top, you can make the large mass of it wax and then just make the very simple top part of it with the lettering or whatever be the only part that's resin that needs to be burned out. So, you know, there's there's millions and millions and millions. We haven't even scratched the surface of all of the different things that we can do with it. That's excellent. And we've shown, you know, a number of pictures of flat pieces, but you've also started having some success with things like hollow filigree beads. Could you walk folks through that particular application as it relates to mold making? Sure. Yeah, this is uh, this is an interesting concept. Um, you know, I, I started hearing a while back that companies like um, Pandora, you know, it, I, it always made me wonder, how are they getting, how are they getting those, um, all those hollow beads so inexpensively. And, and I found out through a friend of mine that they were using water soluble wax um, in order to do that. And I thought, well, that works really well for the 3D printing aspect of this because I can 3D print a mold. Here it is, the mold that I've done and inject a, a wax bead that out of water soluble wax. And then I make the rest of the mold um, and I'm printing this mold in uh, the robust ABS uh, material, put the water soluble bead inside of it 
and then inject the uh, the other part of the the robust mold and inject that with the traditional wax, and then I end up all you have to do is put the uh, you know the the bead with the with the sprue on it and everything into the ultrasonic. The middle part of the bead will dissolve, and you've ended up with a, a hollow uh, piece that would have been a very difficult mold making process uh, in the past. That now can be a pretty simple, uh, pretty simple way to do it, and end up with some interesting geometry, making things that are, you know, oval and hollow, and um, you know, things from lockets and things like that that have been really hard to do before. Um, but because of you know the fact that it's done in CAD, you end up with geometry that's very predictable in the mold. You can start applying different materials and different steps and things like that, and doing and making molds of things that would have been very difficult before. So this is a this is a good example. That would have been very very hard in any possible way that you can think of to either print it. Or you know, or just do it in any of the old traditional methods. Period. A bead like that would have been very difficult to do. So um, this makes it simple, makes it easy. Um, you know, the CAD parts a little bit difficult, you know, but the time saving is is huge. So you know, you end up with so much time saved in it that you know, from the back end of it, that it it allows you to spend the time on the front end and and do the mold and get it done right so that's a great example you know i think it might help people because we've gone through a couple applications you like a lot of folks are having printers where you direct print and castable material you also have this mold making capability how do you think about or what advice would you have about what kinds of pieces are best to do with a mold uh, versus multi-materials in a mold versus just direct print and cast well you know, of course, your flatter objects are obviously going to be easier. I mean, that's just that's just a, a given. Um, that's a pretty simple mold to make. You know, you just put it in there. <laughs> you have a top half of the mold, the bottom half of the mold. You bullion it out or surface model it, however you want to do it. Um, there's some great surface modeling ways of doing that now with... Um, um, some tools that are in Rhino now that uh, make it a lot easier. But um, so obviously your flatter things are going to be easier. You know, you can do things that aren't flat and do things that are say domed or, you know, I actually did a pendant that was domed that, um, that worked real well. You end up with with resilient. You end up with some, um, you know, with some um, just difficulties when it comes to the uh, resolution that, that we're able to get out of res resilient right now. Because obviously it wasn't optimized for making molds in the beginning. So as that resolution comes down, it'll make things like that a lot a lot better and a lot easier. But um, you know, making making the mold out of one material is obviously easier than making mold, a mold out of, you know, multiple multiple materials. You know, so um, it just depends on how much time you want to, you know, you want to put into it, or you how much time the job will allow you to put into it. You know, if if you're going to do ten of something and it's relatively flat, then you'd want to do that in resilient and and you know, just make it quick and easy. If you're going to do a thousand of something like this hollow filigree bead, then obviously you'd want to do it in a uh, material that you get a better resolution. And when you can get a better resolution, you know, you have time savings at the end. So you can actually spend more time up front on, on the mold. Um, you know, you end up with some crazy geometry that's that's hard to print. Sometimes it's easier to to just make a uh, make a mold and cast it directly from the mold. Some geometry you have to look at. Some geometry, you know, some particular models, it's going to be easier just to print it and and skip the mold process altogether. You know, um, it's 
the the 3D printed mold is not the answer for everything. It's just a really good answer for some things. <laughs> and some things, it, you know, it's it's absolutely fantastic. So, and everybody just has to kind of judge that for themselves. I've found huge uses for it, you know, bracelet links, things like that, that, that you want that absolute precision fit. Um, you can get that with this, you know, so it's great. It's absolutely fantastic for certain things, certain things that it, it you know, it's not going to be unless you're going to make a thousand of them, you know, mm -hmm. so. That's some great tactical advice for people. Um, and since we have a variety of customers and also people that aren't current customers, we thought it'd be helpful to walk through what the workflow is that Patrick's talking about and using. So from CAD, it enters directly into our fast technology powered by B9 Crate 2.0. That's our CAM software where you can support and orient your models, or in this case, just snap that mold flat to the build table and be able to print. And then use a variety of materials, whether you need customer try-ons in under 15 minutes or a tray of castable rings in under 45 minutes, or to Patrick's point, a silicone mold in one to three hours. That's where our push button technology comes into play out of the box and printing in about 15 minutes. So the whole system's easy to use. And then it moves into post-processing. So automated cleaning and then curing in minutes. So you get a whole piece in under an hour. With this particular material, that is for our B9 Core 5 Series XL. So that particular printer is formulated with different internal mechanics, different VAT technology designed to handle silicone, which is a, a thick, a viscous material. And then again, with a larger clean and cure, so you can have post-processing that matches the volume production of the machine. I would love to give you an opportunity too, Patrick, just to talk through some other best practices in terms of implementing 3D printed molds with this printer technology. Well, um, you know, with, with every time I make a mold, I, I end up finding things that that work better than the last one. So <laughs> I don't think we'll ever get to the point where it's like, yep, that's it. It's perfect. <laughs> so, you know, I've uh, I started adding, uh, using little spheres to line up my molds and, and make uh, locks out of the, the little spheres. I've, I have started going to, um, you know, using surfaces like we have here, where I just take a, uh, a circle and, uh, and then I extrude it at an angle and I'm, I'm extruding it like about a 20, uh, draft angle of about 25 to 30. And just, to, I extrude it up a little bit and, uh, and, and make part of it. And then all I do is take and offset that by about uh, three hundredths of a millimeter to make the cutter part of it. So then I just take and put them in between the top half and the bottom half. I bullion the bottom to the bottom, and then I take the cutter part and cut out of the, the top half of the mold. And that helps to keep things lined up and everything. I, we were talking earlier about the fact that um, we put our model numbers on the molds. And uh, so this last mold I made, I actually put the model number and that ended up being the lock. So you had the model number written out and it ended up being the lock to the top. So you would definitely know that this top half went to this bottom half and that worked real well. Uh, my my staff was really proud of me that I did something so organized. <laughs> so um, the other thing is, I mentioned this earlier that you want to have uh, some type of venting in it. You you will learn over time where you're going to have problems with air escaping, and you so you you end up automatically knowing I'm going to need to put a vent right here because I'm not going to be able to get uh, the air out. So like on this particular um, cathedral ring, I added the vents to the very top and used a, a little hollow sphere in the, uh, in the mold. That little hollow sphere works really well for a vacuum assisted uh, injection like we have, because whenever you go to uh, inject a mold, it actually creates a little vacuum inside of that sphere and helps to pull the wax in. 
Um, it works pretty much as well with a uh, traditional pressurized wax injection system because it gives the air a place to go. You know, if if you were having trouble with this mold, for instance, and it wasn't injecting properly, all you would have to do is take a little vent uh, from from that sphere to the outside surface, and it would it would inject fine. So um, another thing that I came up with after, if you noticed in some of the slides earlier, my locks were straight. Um, here in this middle example, I started making the uh, the locks tapered, which makes them uh, a whole lot easier to just press out. Um, that ended up being a time savings because we were having to actually take a little tool and hammer them in. And now you can just take a tool and push them and they, and they fall right out. Um, so that, that kind of helps speed things out, speed things up quite a bit. Um, another thing here, we're, uh, we mentioned this earlier with ribbon offset that's in, uh, in Rhino seven, uh, the ribbon offset command ends up making molds that are, um, you know, kind of a difficult surface like here in this, in this image. Um, it makes it a whole lot easier to surface model them and you're not having to try to bullion them out. You can run into problems with bullions uh, just because of the way bullions work. And um, anytime I'm actually teaching someone to make a mold, I explain that in detail about, you know, the times where you want to surface model it, the other times you want to bullion it out. But uh, this ribbon offset makes it, makes it pretty simple. Uh, and, uh, and it allows, allows you to, to uh, surface model it, which, you know, we'll get you some of the uh, more interesting geometry than, than just trying to bullion it out. That's great. And maybe do you want to touch on what made your life easier in CAD <laughs> so between Rhino and this YouTube video for folks looking to get into 3D printing mold? Uh, you know, CAD has been an interesting challenge. I, I was a I was a bench jeweler before I was a, a CAD designer, and when I first started learning CAD, um, I did a lot of wax carving. So my whole approach to the way that I do things in CAD is kind of different than some people because I still approach it the same way I carved wax. Um, when I first started trying to learn CAD, it was it was it was hard because it would take me two hours or three hours to draw something in CAD that would take me 45 minutes to carve in wax. <laughs> so, um, you know, anyone that's been on the bench for very long will know that your shortcuts will often take you longer than, than just doing it right, the, you know, the, the first time. So you don't want your shortcuts and you don't want your the things that are going to save you time to cost you in, in quality or cost you, um, you know, in, in time overall. So, you know, I kind of think of it as like, you know, if you were lining up a whole bunch of shot glasses and you have a gallon of water to pour into them, is it better to just dump the water on top or is it, you know, do you pour one, you know, very slowly and individually? And that's what I think CAD has done in 3D printing has done is it allows you, because you have that time savings from the geometry being correct, hopefully, <laughs> but from the geometry, geometry being correct at the end, it's giving you time savings up front. And that time savings up front, you can spend more time on the model. Same, it's the same thing with, with 3D printing molds. You end up with with a time saving on finishing, you're not having to clip all your supports off. You know, you're not having to do all this kind of stuff that, um, that takes you so much time when you're doing more than one piece. Um, it allows you to, to spend a whole lot more time up front on getting it done right the, the first time. You know, people, you hear people say when it comes to shooting or anything else, they say, you know, fast is slow and slow is fast. So the more time you can spend doing it right, the faster the overall process is going to be. 
And even even though it might have been faster to do something in the beginning, it cost you time on the on the back end. So this is a way of actually slowing down, spending the time in the beginning and and saving time on the back end. Mm -hmm. That's great perspective. <clears throat> you know, we wanted to give you one other example um, from Oscar. So Oscar Valenti of Diamond Inc. and Master Castian CAD, he runs both a storefront and a kind of a large scale casting house. And so he was spending a lot of time with other 3D printing technology, calibrating, fixing down broken machines, instead of with customers making sales. So when he adopted our core series printers, originally he changed his business model. You know, there's no calibrations, it's fast and reliable. You can print a design in minutes and make a same day sale. Go from design to try on to closing that deal. And so he was already producing about five times uh, what he used to with our technology. Now he's taken it a step further and has adopted this 3D printing molds, cutting three additional steps out of his process, no master. You know, when we last, spoke he had been doing 70 plus molds in just a few months and he's now up to 15 a day. And maybe you can speak a little bit to this too, Patrick, but we wanted to throw some examples up here so you could see what does it look like to do multiple materials. That picture with the gray and the black, and then you can see the wax injected ring. That's a perfect example of how to incorporate those multiple materials into your final finished piece. Would you wanna add anything here about kind of the applications he's doing? You know, I, you know, first of all, I've, it's fascinating to me to see other people using, you know, using a, uh, a shortcut that I found. <laughs> so um, it's, it's really neat. And Oscar is doing an amazing job with me. I, I see the things he's doing and, and I go, oh, that's a great idea. And then I want to use it. And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, we talked about this earlier that, um, I really, really look forward to is the other people trying this technology out, learning how to do it, and then showing how they did it, and you know, and and blowing my mind with with their creativity because um, you know we hadn't. I say this a lot. We hadn't scratched the surface on on what this this will do. So you know, it's fascinating. To, to see me uh or you know to see oscar and and what he's doing and um we have a we have a facebook group where we're in the same group uh 3d printed molds and um you know every he, he posts stuff on there all the time and i get to see different molds and different approaches and everything so you know my hat's off to him i am so glad he's getting success out of this and uh, you know, it's it's a real honor for me to actually have been a small part of of you know something that that he's getting so much success out of. Yeah, it's been super fun to see in that Facebook group. And so Patrick today has given a high level overview of some of the components and best practices with three D printed molds. But if you want the comprehensive guide, which is a step by step white paper, that setup video. We'll give you the full 25 minute CAD demo, tips, tricks, and more. You can get that for free if you just include it whenever you purchase silicone in our cart. You add that guide right to it and that will come with all of Patrick's expertise um, inside of a white paper. So you can really get an in-depth look and be successful from the start. So as we transition to q and I'll just remind you again, feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A box and we'll kick them off. So you already talked a little bit about the best applications for 3D printed molds. You know, another question that we got is, how soft is the mold compared to a silicone mold? Kind of what, what does it look like between those two types of materials? Um, you know, for the most part, the CAD work can take a, an, you know, anywhere from an hour to, you know, I've, I've spent as much as five hours on, on a, on a CAD part on something that was really complicated. And it's not, it's not so much as that it was difficult. It was just that I end up finding things that I know I can correct. So I end up printing the mold again, you know, I'll, I'll do something and I'll find something that it's like, Oh, if I had just moved this, you know, a little bit more, it would have, it would have made the, uh, the, the process a 
again, like I said, afterwards a lot better. So some molds, you know, I can, I can easily do the CAD work in 15, 20 minutes and, uh, and then they're printing, um, I've had very few that take more than two and a half hours to print. Um, depending on the size, this is another thing. It's like, you know, you, you <laughs> we're used to molds being a particular size because the mold frame that we use to vulcanize <laughs> was a particular size. And that was kind of another thing. It's like, Oh, I can make them smaller now. It's like, that's weird. Um, but um, the smaller molds, you know, take an hour or so to, to, uh, to print. Um, you end up, like I was mentioning before, it's an unknown whenever you're, you're dealing with the old way of doing it. Sometimes, sometimes when you go and you cut it, you make a mistake and, and then you have to go back and, uh, you know, and, and repack it and recut it. So I've found that there's, there's a pretty good time saving just on the fact that you're able to, uh, to skip those steps. Even if you have to correct something and make another mold, which, you know, which, like I said, on the more complex things I've had to do, you're still looking at days of overall time saving, you know, a, a regular RTV, you know, set up overnight where I can have, I can start on the CAD in the morning, have a mold and have 50 waxes to inject by the end of the day or waxes out of the mold by the end of the day, you know? So there's an enormous time savings, uh, you know, when it comes to that aspect. That's great. We had another question come in to just talk a little bit more about the injector you're using recommendations. If you're wanting to switch to 3d printing molds. Well, um, any injector will work. I mean, just a traditional, um, pressurized wax injector from, uh, you know, the, the $250 one that you can get from, or maybe 280 with inflation. I don't know, but, uh, they have one's got a little hand pump on it. That I think it's, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Um, I'm using, uh, I actually have a, a pressurized one that I use with, um, compressed air. And that's what I have my water soluble wax in. So, and then I have a, uh, a vacuum assisted, uh, Riachi that, um, that is a, is a great machine. Um, you know, every, every machine has its limitations. Um, I think the, the, the traditional pressurized one has less limitations than the Riachi because the Riachi sometimes will have trouble getting a vacuum. If you can't get a vacuum, it's not going to inject. So then you have to increase clamp temperature and or clamp pressure and, and things like that. Um, where with the traditional, you know, wax mold, it's like let me just crank up the pressure a little bit and go for it. You know, um, if you're trying to get the same exact repeatable results, then a vacuum assisted injection system is much better. You know. It'll give you, if you end up with a bubble in it, <laughs> without changing the settings, you can inject it again and you get the same bubble in the same place, you know? <laughs> so these wax injecting machines can be incredibly precise when it comes to getting stuff like that. But um, if you're just looking at getting injections and you don't need the precision, then a, a, a traditional uh, you know, pressurized wax plot works great. That's great. We, you touched on this a little bit, but we also had a question about what does shelf life look like? Shelf life look like with these 3D printed molds versus um, rubber molds? Can you say that again, like five times yeah. really fast? <laughs> yeah. What is the shelf life, the shelf life of a 3D printed mold compared to a rubber mold and how should people think about shelf life when you're going to additive manufacturing? Well, your, your rubber mold is, um, is no longer a physical thing. It's, it's digital, you know, you can, 
I haven't had any issues where the actual physical rubber mold part has broken down yet. I'm sure they do. I'm sure there's a shelf life. I haven't really discovered that yet. But again, it's, it's very easy to just simply um, print another one, you know, it, it take a, anywhere from an hour to three hours to just print another one. It, it may actually be a time savings to just, you know, instead of looking around all over the shop to try to find a mold that you did three years ago, it, it may actually be simpler to just print another one. You know, it'd be done in a couple of hours. You can spend, I've spent weeks looking for molds before in the past, you know, and and you just kind of give up and you go, well, I'm going to stumble across it at some point. You know, the fact that you can have your wax mold stored on Dropbox is just huge. I mean, that's going to be, you know, that's going to be a real time saver for a lot of people because it's like, can't find it. Just print another one real quick, you know? So, um, but like I said, I haven't run into uh, any problem with the the mold breaking down. It'll I think it'll it'll last as long as you're gentle with it. You know, you can get rough with them and and they and they break. Uh, I've gotten rough with them and had them crack in half. You know, but it wasn't <laughs> wasn't that big of a deal for me because I just printed another one. So <laughs> that's good. I think that answers a lot of our open questions. You know, as as we wrap up here, if you'd like to learn anything more about anything you've seen today, printers, mold making, et cetera, or would like a consultation with a rep about getting a sample, you can visit our website here, b9c.com slash jewelry mold. And Patrick, I'd just love to give you an opportunity as we wrap up. Is there anything else that you want to add to our conversation we've had here today? Um, you know, I would like, uh, for one, I'd like to... Um, say thank you to uh to b9 i mean you guys have been great you know i i came up with this idea and it was kind of a crazy idea about um six months ago and i um you know i i called megan out of the blue and said hey i can you do something for me? I want to try something, you know, and, and my hat's off to B9 for going, sure, let's, let's try that. <laughs> you know? So I think it's, I think it's very forward thinking of them to, uh, you know, to say, Hey, yeah, let's, let's run with this and see where it goes. You know, we've, we've done some great things. I know some other people and some other companies have attempted to do this with, uh, you know, I don't think they've, came anywhere close to the the amount of success that we've had with it but um you know as far as that's concerned you know b9 has been a great company to work with on 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 this stuff um they've you know y'all have really really helped whenever i said hey i you know this didn't work how can we fix it you know and 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 y'all have been great so uh you know thank y'all for the opportunity to do this it's uh, I, it's really changing things for me, and I think it'll change things for a lot of people. Oh, well, thank you so much, Patrick. We share that sentiment too. You know, part of the fun part about working at a 3D printing company is being able to hear customer ideas and partner with them to bring them to life. So we're excited as well. Um, if you have any other questions, again, feel free to visit that site. You can submit them and contact us. And Patrick and us will circle up after the show and send those out in an answer form too. Thank you everybody for attending.